us. It is the world we live in. We ask, Lord, that as we gather together this morning, as we lift our hands and our hearts in one voice, as we tune our ears to hear the voice of your spirit, as we take our minds and focus on your kingdom this morning, both here and virtually, establish your kingdom in ourselves and in our homes and in our communities. Thy kingdom come. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Prepare our hearts for worship. If you're at home,
rushing to my
shepherd. Jesus.
Please be seated. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be in the presence 
our King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's prepare our hearts this morning to worship the Lord in our giving. As I do that, last week we talked about quiet quitting. The verse we use is Luke 6:38, give and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together. Shall it be fall into your lap? And I, I talked about when we talked about that idea of good measure living, it wasn't only about giving of your finances, although that's part of it. It was talked about we talked about giving your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, kindness, maybe a smile, but just to give more. And we live in a world right now where everybody in every way is giving bare minimum. Jesus says to go the extra mile, and we're just not doing that. And, and I understand. I, we look out there, um, electric bills going up 48%. Uh, the heating oil, probably 25% on, on our last oil delivery here. And so we're all feeling that crunch. But it shouldn't... It shouldn't change Jesus in our lives. We still give. We still love. We still do all the things that God required us to do or asks us to do. We continue in those things. And we do it because he said, if we do, it's come back to us, pressed down, shaken, shall men pour into your lap. I say that because I want to remind us that even if you're at home, that we can, you can give online and you can send your offering in. I say it because we have our Operation Christmas Child coming up. We have our annual Thanksgiving giveaway coming up. And I say it because I know we're all struggling. But if God has blessed you, and I, I got to tell you, and I, 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 he says this to me all the time. If God has blessed you, and if you're, you're probably blessed if you live in the United States, period. Um, give and bless others. It's just that simple. Um, and I got to tell you, sometimes I wonder that um, it's not easy to give. And I wonder that, it, that, that it's also... We look out and we see how much, other, how much more maybe someone else has. But I cannot outgive God. I'm human. I look around and I say, gee, you know, that tithe or that offering would go a long way somewhere else. And then I realize that I thank God for the privilege of giving to Him because He's given it all to me. Everything I have, He's given to me. Amen? Amen. Pastor John. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We all stand for our offering this morning. Praise the Lord. What a giving. Thank you, Father. Lord, you are the giver of all good things, and your word makes so clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Yes. Father, we ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter to the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and most importantly, hope in this hope star of the world, Lord. Yes. Just as you multiplied the offering of fish and loaves that were given freely for others, we pray that you would multiply these our offerings to you and accomplish with them more than we could ever ask or imagine. And Father, we ask that you would use us, use us, and all we have as your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'd like you to bring your offering forward. Again, we are short staffed. People have to work. People are sick. Just bring your offering to the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah.
this morning, I'll be speaking about speaking on God, the God, God will remember no more, out of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 to 12. But let's just take a moment, and scripture says, his house shall be called a house of prayer. And I'm sure that there are many of us who have prayer needs on our heart. There are also a lot of people who have prayer needs, and we just want to lift them to you. Uh, David and Grace are still at home. My son-in-law Joseph is still at home, recovering. Sharon is still at home, uh, struggling with life and, and getting over her surgery. Dan Malark is, is struggling. Pastor Barbel is traveling, but she had to go home to take care of some business, legal things with her parents. But she's struggling with her, her knees and, and all the discomforts that she's going through. And I just want you to t think, of, take a moment, and let's let's corporately lift them to the Lord. And all the others out there that need help. Dorothy's at home, and she's struggling as well. She's doing better all the time, but we want to see her uh, restored to health. Hallelujah. Heavenly Fathers, we gather together with one heart and one voice. We are reminded the, that the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. We thank you, Lord, that your ear is not deaf to our prayers, that your arm is not short, that you cannot reach down and divinely intervene in every life situation, Lord. Right now, every need on every heart this morning, every prayer request on the hearts this morning, both here and virtually, we ask that you meet them. Lord, I ask that those that we have specifically mentioned, that you meet the need in their lives right now. Bring healing to those that need healing. Restoration to those that need restoration. Provision to those that need provision. In Jesus' name, we unite our hearts, our spirits, and our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Jesus' name, The God who will remember no more. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. We'll be getting there in a couple of moments. We're all familiar with the term cancel culture. The power to cancel just about anyone is out there. We live in a culture that's ready to do it in an instant to just about anyone. Just this week I was reading, I only get head nine to lose, so I can only tell you the headlines. Um, a top executive at Apple who had been there at a company more than 20 years, devoted, committed, was torched his entire reputation, his job. Now, he was canceled. Admittedly, he made an inappropriate remark um, to a reporter, paraphrasing a line from a 1980 movie, um, Arthur with Dudley Moore. I, I don't think the remark anybody should say, but I'm sure that he was joking. Um, and I, I can't defend the joke, I would never say it myself. But his apologies fell on deaf ears. He finds himself out of a job, terminated, canceled by a company who they themselves have a documented history of exploiting child labor in order to keep costs down. Uh, but, never mind, I don't wanna go there. That's not part of my message. I tend to get off on uh, other things. Let's go back. We live in a culture that is canceled crazy, quick to cancel those who run afoul with their ever-shifting standards. And once you're canceled, there's little hope to getting back in the culture's good graces. Redemption is rare. Rare. And the sad thing is, you can be canceled for something you did last week, last month, last year, 
as we've seen so many times, we can even be canceled for something you did decades ago and more. People have been fired or not hired because of tweets that they tweeted in 2010, or things that they said when they were teenagers. No amount of saying I'm sorry, groveling, can make it right. Most frustrating of all, this rule seems to be arbitrary because there are some who have been given a permanent pass. They can say or do anything that they choose to without any repercussion. But again, let's not go there. It's another time, another message. But one of the most frustrating features of this so-called cancel culture is not the fact that people are being held accountable to their actions. That's a good thing, actually. But it's disheartening the aspect that it appears that there's no room for redemption. Even if you said something wrong decades ago, the common thinking is, that's who you are, that's who you'll always be, and no one will ever forget it. And the truth is, whatever, whoever, if there's a person in charge, which I don't know that there is, but whoever or whatever is going on, I guarantee you that every single one of them live in fear that someone's going to find something, remember something that they said or did. Because I don't think there's anybody out there that doesn't have a skeleton. Something they wish they had never said or done. What's sad is we see this dynamic at work everywhere. The tendency to never forget and never forgive. We see it in marriages, we see it in families, communities, the workplace, churches, any place people come together. This is who you are, this is always who you'll be, and there's nothing you can do to change it. One of the saddest things that I've seen in this idea of cancel someone, I'll call it here, I like a comedy on TV called Young Sheldon. Anybody ever watch it? And normally it's funny. And I don't like, I like to watch comedies. I don't need, I got enough serious stuff in my world. But anyway, and I'm not particularly fond of when comedies take on serious topics. Lately, there's something that happened in this particular comedy. If you haven't watched it, I'll give you a quick synopsis. Sheldon is a boy genius in college, and he turns into the Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. Throws up to me. So they're showing his younger life. Here in this, the last few episodes, his older brother, I was only 17, got a young woman, a, an older woman, pregnant out of wedlock. And the saddest thing that I saw was that in those preceding episodes, her mother's a very religious woman, worked at the church, did everything you can possibly imagine to, sh to try to be righteous. And because her son did not want to marry, or vice versa, his girlfriend didn't want to marry him, her entire life's work was canceled by the church. She lost her job. She, they said they were welcome, but they went into church and everybody in the place, everybody in the place gave her the cold shoulder, shunned her as if she'd had a scarlet letter on her chest. Two things about it that really bothered me. One is that in some places it's probably true. That's too bad. But worse even 
is that that's probably how the world sees the church. And it's not supposed to be that way. We are supposed to be forgiving and gracious and kind and merciful. We don't shoot our own when they make mistakes. For this reason, this passage of scripture has never been more countercultural than it is today. It's a promise that goes against the grain of everything that we've seen, against all these sanctimonious finger pointers and everything they stand for. While they're saying, we'll never let you forget what you did, the God of Israel, the God of the universe says, I love you, I forgive you, and I will remember your sins no more. Hallelujah. Especially when we live in this culture. Thank God. Turn your Bibles this morning to... Hebrews 8, I'll be reading verses 8 to 12. This is the author's quoting from Jeremiah, and he says, For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. On that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put their law, my laws, into their minds. I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In this passage, God is promising, as he quotes Jeremiah, something that seems impossible, something that seems on the surface to be too good to be true, that you can be forgiven once and for all and forever, that all the misdeeds of the past, no matter how great or how small the number is, will be remembered no more. This offer is a new covenant, an ironclad agreement that we can build our lives on, empowering us to overcome the past and redline, uh, redefine our future. And I was studying this and I really found this amazing. God has offered us a new covenant, and usually that, and I include agreement, but that word covenant typically means a contract between two people or two partners. In this case, however, William Barclay tells us that the Greek word doesn't refer to a contract, but a will. And there's a big difference between the two. It's significant. Two persons negotiate a contract. You do your part, I'll do mine. In a will, however, there's nothing reciprocal. Nothing one gives, the other receives. God has given us a new covenant, one in which we simply receive his grace, his mercy, his love, forgiveness, period. This is how God wants to relate to his people. And the good news is it's for all of us. Because the fact is it doesn't matter what yesterday was. It doesn't take long to discover just how critical family members can be, how condemnation of a crowd can keep holding you down. What's even sadder, now listen carefully because I'm speaking to someone out there who needs to hear it. One of the worst people that can cancel you is you. I don't deserve God's grace and mercy. 
I don't deserve his blessing. I've made too many mistakes. Even God can't save me. If I walk through the doors of the church, the building will fall down. God has every reason to turn away from me. And I want you to know something. There are a lot of people who believe this. There are a lot of Christians who maybe believe that God has saved them. But that's all they can grasp because they cancel themselves because of everything else they've done. We serve the God who says, I will remember no more. And I want to talk to you just for a moment. I'm not there yet. I want to talk to you for just a moment about the God who will remember no more. How many of you have heard the expression, an elephant never forgets? God is even better than the elephant. Do you know why God will remember no more? Simply because he has, as an act of his will, chosen to forget it forever. He didn't really, he just has chosen to put it out of his mind or out of his consciousness forever. That's how much God loves us. And if that, if you understand that truth, now listen to me. If you understand that truth, who or what else in the world has a right to accuse you when the God of the universe has made a choice to willfully forget anything that's ever happened, any sin you've ever committed, and give you another chance to move forward. No one. God wants to draw you into his presence, to wash away your sins, to make you holy once and for all and forever. The basis of this new covenant is a second chance. On my sermon it says plus. Second chance is plus. I saw everybody and now it says it. <laughs> the idea behind it is that it's not just a second chance. We'll get to that in a moment. Verses 8 to 10 says, I will make a new covenant. A will. This covenant will not be one like the one I made with your ancestors, they did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them. But this is the new covenant I will make, in spite of the fact that they weren't faithful to the old covenant, God promised to give them an even better covenant, one that his people could keep. Our God is the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, 100 chances, 10,000 chances. Why? Oh my God, really? Why? Is that true? Is it possible? Absolutely, positively. And do you know why God gives us so many chances? We need them. We need them. In the Old Testament, we see time and time again how God's people turned away from him and they turned back to him. Every time he, they turned back, he restored. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of forgiveness. He's a God of another chance. Actually, we need to understand that every time we think about extending or accepting God's extended mercy, there's always the person who says, does that mean I can sin all that I want and God will still give me another chance? It's always the same. How far, how close to the fire can I get without getting burnt? How little can I do? This is what we talked about last week, the quiet quitting. How little can I do? But the truth is, 
Once you accept Jesus Christ, the way it works is that you sin more than you want. That's because you surrendered your life to him and the Holy Spirit comes into your life and something changes in you. You become a new creation, a new creation. All things passed away, all things are new, or what Paul says. And God begins to make changes in you. And in the process of changing you, he begins to shape and conform you to the image of Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, when that process starts, you actually sin more than you want. Paul said it in Romans, that I do the things I don't want to do. I, do, I can't do the things I want to do. I, I'm confused, but I try and try and try. Bottom line is, God is there over and over again. I will tell you this, while Paul makes it sound like that it's an instantaneous thing, well, God says he'll let it go, you're a new creation, old things are passed away, it doesn't happen overnight. I can only tell you that it takes longer than 44 years. Do we all get that? That's how long I've been saved. What you'll discover is that you stumble a lot more than you want to. What you'll discover is that you're falling flat on your face or foolishly wandering off the path. It doesn't bring you nearly as much fulfillment as it does walking in close connection with Jesus Christ. When you make a decision to follow Christ, you inevitably discover that you sin more than you want to. You'll discover that you get frustrated by your own limitations. And then if we continue on that path, it will lead to despair. It's when you feel that way that you need to remember that God is the God of second chances or hundred chances or five thousand chances. The basis of that covenant, this new covenant that gives us these things, is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He says he will write his law on our hearts. There is no one on the planet who has better access to God than you do. Occasionally, I get emails and texts that um, supposedly come from Pastor John. And so, obviously, anytime Pastor John, I open them. And I begin to read them. And there are some words used in there, or some phrases that have come up, that Pastor John would never use. So I swipe left and hit delete. It's just that simple. Well, how do I know that Pastor John didn't send me? Didn't say those things to me? Because I know him. I think I know him well. He's my friend. I'm pretty sure, after all these years, I've got a good idea of how he thinks. But I certainly know what he would never say or never do. That's what God is saying here. He says, I will write my laws on your heart. What that means is that you have a relationship with him, not with a book, not with a building, not with a denomination. You know him personally. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't read the Bible. There's definitely benefit from the Bible. There's benefit from the connection to the local church. But, our, but we are need to understand our life is in him. Verse 11, he says, And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord for everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already. What he's saying is, we don't need teachers and preachers. No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, we don't need a mediator. No one on the planet 
has a better access to God than you do. We are all equal. From verse 11, he says, from the least to the greatest. From the least to the greatest. Why is it important that we understand this? Because we live in a culture that is now trying to cancel individuals and tell them they have no value because they made a mistake, because they said the wrong thing, because they did the wrong thing, even if they did it 50 years ago. And I, I want you to think just for a moment. Are you the same person you were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or more? Do you want to be judged for your life by who you were at 18 and not who you are now? The mistakes or the shortcomings you may have made in a, literally a previous lifetime? No. We have the ability to have an individual relationship with God that supersedes all other relationships. The church, although I believe in the church, doesn't have the power to provide you a relationship. It doesn't have the power to withhold you with a relationship. You are in control of your relationship with God in every single way. Now the church, it exists to help you, to help make the most out of that relationship, to help you grow closer to him, to provide an opportunity to serve. But your relationship with God is completely dependent of anyone. Any church, now your husband can't do it for you, your wife can't do it for you, your mother, your father can't do it for you, your children can't do it for you. Nobody, not a church, not a family member, not a person or a preacher can take the place of an intimate relationship with God. God wants you to know him personally. And the reason is, much the same as I said with Pastor John, that way when something is said or done, or you feel a certain way, or someone says or does something, you can say, that's not the God I know. And I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it for Christendom in general, but there are many times that I hear Christians say things, and my heart of hearts said, that's not the God I know. I don't know that they are serving the living God, and I'm not going to comment to that or what that might be, but I know for a fact that that's not the God I know. They may be serving the God of religion or a denomination or being even sucked into the political fray. I don't know, but that's not the God I know. And here's the thing. Scripture tells us that God is immutable. How many of you know what that means? Unchangeable. Period. That's all it means. He's unchangeable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God wants you to know him personally. He's available for everyone from the least to the greatest. It doesn't matter who you are. You belong to him, and you can know him. The basis of that covenant, and I love this one, it's probably my favorite, the, is a clean slate. He forgives you, he promises he'll remember it no more. God doesn't hang on to your past, and neither should you. And I love the verse 12. And I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. As I said before, I'm sure there are people in your life that will not hesitate to remind you of a missed opportunity, past mistakes. If you're on social media, Complete strangers are more than willing to take you to task. 
while humans do this to one another, maintaining a permanent record, and I love this, maintaining a permanent record of every past indiscretion, God makes it clear that in the new covenant, that is not how he relates to us. He doesn't count the number of times he forgives you. And when he forgives you, he promises he will remember it no more. We have a clean slate with God. 1 John 1, 9 says it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. Every time we confess, he forgets. And that, that's unbelievable to me. How far Psalm 103, 12 says it this way, he removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. Isaiah 38, 17, he places our sins behind his back. Micah 7, 19 says he will trample your sons under his feet and throw them in the dip, depths of the ocean. What it teaches us is cut and dry. We serve a God who forgives our sins and forgets them. He puts them in the trash bin and then he deletes the trash bin because he doesn't want to leave it hanging around. He never intends to bring it up again. They're gone forever. When God says he's given us a clean slate, it's clean. He doesn't hang on to your past, neither should you or I. Some people think every time I sin, that God's up in heaven going, we'll add this to your list, we'll check, you did this, you did that, you did this. And I want you to understand, God says, no, every time you ask for forgiveness, the slate is wiped clean. It's like an etch sketch. Remember those as a kid? Some of you aren't old enough or too, too, whatever. But an etch sketch, you draw a picture and it's terrible. You made a mistake, you turn left instead of right. You, you, it just looks ugly as, ugly as sin and you go, ah! oh, it's okay, let's start over again. That's the way it is with God. It doesn't matter how big the mistake, how ugly the sin, how great it is. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has given us a clean slate. And I want you to understand something. He just didn't do it the day you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He'll give you a clean slate every single time you make a mistake, every single time you sin, every single time you're disobedient, every time you're rebellious. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I want you to understand something. God knows that all of us will struggle. He, he knows. And he's already provided forgiveness. He's already given us the clean slate. God will remember no more. Now, I want you to think of something. How many of you, as I'm preaching, I'm sure some of you thought of things that you did that you just wish you'd never did or never said. God doesn't remember them. What right do you have? What right do you have? Do you think you're smarter than God? Bigger than God? Now, if only we were that, even if only we could will ourselves not to remember, maybe we can. But we can ask God to help us not remember. I've been blessed in general, the things I did and other people did to me, I just don't remember them. I don't know why. I mean, if you bring it up, I remember it, but I mean, it doesn't never come to the surface. Uh -huh. I understand that God has given me a clean slate. And whatever mistakes I made, whatever sins I committed, whatever I did in the past is in the past. And there's nothing in this life that I can do to change the past. I can only change 
who I am today. Period. And if I do that every day, I'm determining my future as well. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. This idea of redemption, forgiveness, is something our culture knows nothing about. The world wants to hang on to your past simply so that it can be used against you. God wants you to let it go so that you can be free, so that you can be that new creature in Christ that he's called you to be, conformed to the image of his son. Having been made holy, you endeavor to live holy. The bottom line is this, the one who matters most the Most High God, the God of Israel, has washed away your sins, wiped away your past. It doesn't matter what any other person, whether it's a family member, a co-worker, a so-called friend, you belong to God and He has forgiven you once and forever. He says, I will remember no more. I want you to think about it. If God says to you, I will remember no more. What does it matter what anyone else has to say? If God is for us, who can stand against us? What we need to understand is this is what we need to build our lives on going forward. These symbols represent The God who will remember no more. Scripture teaches us that the blood of Jesus has washed us white as snow. He's cleansed us from all sin and all unrighteousness. He's made us a new creature. Each time we take these symbols, Scripture says that we are to remember Christ's work until his return. It's a good thing for us to remember that God is for us. Who can be against us? It's a good thing for us to remember the creator of the universe has forgiven us and told us to let it go and move forward. What does the rest of the world what right do they have to say anything? None. God is on your side. God will remember no more. If you're a believer and you struggle with not being saved, but thinking that God can't bless you, God can't move you, God can't use you because of what you did or some things, some church or some denomination said to you. Remember, all throughout Scripture, New Testament as well, God used some pretty um, savory characters. Paul was a murderer. Peter was a little bit of a hothead. Thomas was a doubter. The list goes on. But when they came to Jesus, all things were passed away. And God remembered no more. And he used them to do great things. Amen. 
he can use you and I in the same way. As we prepare to take these symbols this morning, let the Holy Spirit pour over you this morning in a way you haven't experienced feel and embrace the love of God, the God who will remember no more. On the night in which Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, he raised it and he gave thanks, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him this morning. Again, when dinner was ended, he took the cup. Again, he raised it and he gave thanks, saying, This is the cup of my blood, the blood of a new and everlasting covenant shed for you and all men for the remission of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of him this morning. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, ask right now that your Holy Spirit descend upon all who hear the sound of my voice. Let your Holy Spirit fall. Remind each and every person that they have a relationship with you, that they have access to the throne room of grace, that you've made them a new creature, and God, that you will remember no more. Pour out on every life and every heart this morning. Give them hope. Direction. And a future. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you've ever felt canceled, today's the day to say, no more. If you ever felt like you couldn't do anything, today's the day to say, that's a lie. If you've ever thought, I'll never overcome those things. I know, this is a postscript, so give me a second. I'll never overcome those things. That very well could be true. But the good news is, you don't have to. Jesus said, he will forgive all your sins, all unrighteousness, and you can move forward because God will remember them no more. And the truth is, if God doesn't, what do you care what anybody else thinks? Amen. God bless everyone. Great to have you this morning. Great to see you. We see you. Great to see you virtually. And we will see you again next week. 11 o'clock. God bless and thank you all. Ta-da.